a lot of the, the sermons that I do are merely the outflow of what God is doing inside of me, and I think that's probably the healthiest way to preach. And yet God does this work at varying degrees and levels. And so sometimes you feel like you're going through the same lesson over and over and over again, but it's not necessarily that it's the same, it's at a deeper level. And so it feels the same because it can be the same theme. God can deal with you on pride, I can't even tell you how many times in a lifetime. And yet oftentimes it's at a more refined level. He's not just moving big boulders out anymore. He's, he's down to river rock. And sometimes he's beyond the river rock and he's down to pebbles. But he's always working in the same regard to clear a pathway for his glory to shine through. One of the descriptions I used to give a long time ago of the Christian life, when I was first grabbing a hold of the fact that God desires to move in. And I said, if it's true that God is in my life, why don't people see him through my life? So I was, I was pondering that. Why, if, if it really is true that the Holy Spirit has moved in, then why is it that not many people are seeing that? And so here's the way I likened it. I likened it to a light bulb moving into the center of my life, and then I am a piece of black construction paper wrapped around it. And so what needs to happen in my life is I need to agree with God that he needs to shine through. And so with every step of obedience, it's like a pinprick. And all it takes is one pinprick, and that light can begin to come through. But over a lifetime, what you see is as with steps of obedience and agreement with God, there's less of me, less of that which would block, and more of that which needs to shine forth. And that's just known as sanctification. It doesn't happen instantly, even though that light moved in instantly. The process of having that light shine through without any blockage, which is known as the glory of God, without any hindrance, without any veil, is a lifetime. It's the work of the Holy Spirit. This one's called The Only Place. Ah, it was hard to name this one because I had another name, which was The Most High, which, oh, it's a good title for this one, but... I wanted to emphasize a place in this, and the Most High is a place, but it wouldn't naturally come to you that way. So I'm going to call it the only place. And this is a study in the ancient practice of throwing down high places. That's, that's a cool subtitle, by the way. The, the title isn't that exciting, but that subtitle is, is pretty neat. So I'm, we're picking up right smack in the middle of a story uh, dealing with Hezekiah and what Hezekiah, a good king, mind you, there's not a lot of good kings in the Bible. When you go through the record of kings, not many of them shine. Hezekiah is one of them that does. And so right smack in the middle of all the movement that Hezekiah is going through and broke the images in pieces and cut down the groves and threw down the high places. Isn't that a great statement? And threw down the high places and the altars out of all of Judah and Benjamin and Ephraim also in Manasseh until they had utterly destroyed them all. This is an action message. Uh, so we're going to pick up halfway through your life, dot, 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 and then suddenly you enter into the scene. And as a good leader of your life, in other words, you have one king. There's only one ruler over Israel. Even though they had a king, it was really God. God's in charge, and the king that submits to that God is the one that does right in his eyes. And so you're like this. You're one of those rulers. You have a position in this body to do as God would ask. And how you handle this territory is of the utmost importance. Well, here's what God would say a good king does. Here's another throwing down. This whole, word of, this whole concept of throwing down is, is actually replete throughout the Bible. I'm just going to give you a few glimpses because that's really not what I'm wanting to focus on. And Jehu said, throw her down. You know who it's talking about? Jezebel. So they threw her down, and he tread her underfoot. Did I hear some boos? That was very appropriate, very appropriate. And so that which exalts itself above God. Jezebel exalts herself above Jehovah in the land. She kills all of Jehovah's prophets. And even when Jehu comes to bring judgment from Jehovah, she exalts herself, paints her face, and stands in a high window. And so Jehu co commands all those that are in that house, throw that which is exalted itself above Jehovah down. Isn't that a, a cool statement? Throw her down. So in the New Testament, in the Greek word, we actually have a word for throwing down. Isn't that neat? And it's pale. And it means typically translated to wrestle. We wrestle not. Yeah, that's pale, okay? 
So it means to throw down the opponent and hold him in such a fashion that he cannot rise again. Well, that's wrestling, all right. And yet the idea, scripturally, spiritually, throughout the Bible, because we, we don't necessarily look at the Bible as a wrestling manual. That wouldn't be necessarily how we would think about it, but that's what it is. It's taking anything that would exalt itself above Jehovah, grabbing a hold of it, and throwing it down. Good luck. You want to take on these principalities and powers that have exalted themselves above God? Take your own hands and try and do that? You can't do that. And yet the commission of the new covenant is exactly that. You've been given authority and power. Grab a hold of them, throw them down to the mat so that they can't rise again. The ancient practice of throwing down high places. Oh, isn't this exciting? Some of you aren't as excited as I am. <clears throat> For we, palais, we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Our job isn't to throw down people. That isn't our job. But against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness. Where are these spiritual powers located? In high places. So this idea of high places and throwing down high places is what we're talking about. And that'll make more sense because I'm not just giving you a historical account of how kings threw down high places. The Old Testament is merely a foreshadow. It gives a template. It gives a pattern for how we in the new covenant relationship with Jesus Christ engage in the issues of the soul, our soul and in the souls of others. We have the tools, we need to know how to use them. What is a high place? An eminent attraction, a notorious location, a place where needs are met. Isn't that a strange thought? A high place is a place where people would go to have their needs met. It's a, high, a high place was and is designed for worship, sacrifice, and offering, tended by trained priests to facilitate sacrifice and offerings unto a God. Now, you can't tell in that font that God is not capitalized. In other words, small g God. Okay, a high place is a place that offers a solution for you. Okay, so say you're a farmer and your crops aren't growing or you haven't had any rain. Well, you're in desperate need. So instead of turning to God, Jehovah, what someone would do is there's a God for everything. We don't know that in America, even though we have a God for everything here. But in the ancient days, they actually were gods. They were a form of like a deity. And you would go to them and you would offer something very specific, whether that's, you know, uh, an animal, whether that's your firstborn child, whatever it is, you would offer it up and you would worship that God to gain that God's favor so that you would have rain and your crops would grow. And of course, we will look at that and cluck our tongues and go, are you serious? Those people actually believed that stuff? Uh-huh, and so do we. Now, we don't go to those same measures, which is part of the brilliance of the enemy, is he's created high places throughout our land, in our country, that we go to to find solace and satisfaction because we know that, I mean, God can't do all these things. We need to sort of, you know, make sure that we're dealing with the things that we can deal with. And so, yeah, I'm going to sacrifice over here. I'm going to invest in this. I'm going to do this because if, you know, all else fails, at least that will come through for me. The one place. See, there's a difference between the high place and the one place. The Bible prepares us to understand that there is one place in all the world that we are to go to, that we are to worship and that we are to give our sacrifice at. Leviticus 17 prepares us for this idea. So we're creating a, a kingdom, and Moses is given a law, and the Levites are the ones that implement the law. And so the book of Leviticus is basically training us in how we are to implement the law into this society. And they, Israel, shall no more offer their sacrifices unto devils. Hey, hey guys, no, 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 don't go to a high place. Don't offer your sacrifice to a devil. I mean, to us, it's pretty obvious, too. Okay, yeah, we probably shouldn't do that. After whom they have gone a-whoring, this shall be a statute forever unto them throughout their generations. And thou shalt say unto them, Whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers which sojourn among you, that offers a burnt offering or sacrifice, and brings it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, to offer it unto the Lord... Even that man shall be cut off from among his people. 
even if it's a guy traveling through the country, there is one place that you bring your sacrifice, one place, and it's the door of the tabernacle. If you bring your sacrifice to anyone other than Jehovah, you are cut off from this people. Take heed to thyself that thou offer not thy burnt offerings in every place that thou seest. Don't just offer a burnt offering anywhere, but in the place which the Lord shall choose. You see, there's one place all throughout Scripture, one place in which the offering is supposed to be brought. But in the place which the Lord shall choose in one of thy tribes, there thou shalt offer thy burnt offerings, and there thou shalt do all that I command thee. Now, in the Jewish mind, this place is going to be revealed as Jerusalem, the temple in Jerusalem, and that will become the one place. However, in the Christian mind, we don't just see it as a location on a map. We actually recognize that this is fulfilled in a person, the temple of God who rose from the dead on the third day. And so as a result, this is fulfilled in one known as... <clears throat> I'll hold, hold off on that, just because you may not know yet. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold that back. Bring it unto the door. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will, where? At the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. You see, for us that don't have the basis of the old covenant in our understanding, sometimes we miss when Jesus is described as something specific in the New Testament, it doesn't stand out to us. But the, the door, okay, I'm making it very uh, emphasized for you just so you catch it here. The door. Whatsoever man there be of the house of Israel, or of the strangers which sojourn among you, that offers a burnt offering or sacrifice and brings it not unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation to offer it unto the Lord, even that man shall be cut off from among his people. Jesus says, I am the door. You know that one place you're supposed to bring the offering? I am that place. Isn't that a strange thought to think of Jesus being a place? He's the only place. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. He's the only place. Jesus answered and said to them, destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. But he spoke of the temple of his body. So that which is revealed in the Old Testament as the one place that all that worship Jehovah are supposed to bring their sacrifices and their offerings and their praise and their tithes to, everything that their life is, they bring it unto this door. That one is fulfilled and revealed in the person of Jesus Christ who is both the temple and the door. A high place. So let's get down to brass tacks of what a high place really is. Because when we look at old-timey Israel, we think of high places and they have these altars to Baal and Ashtaroth. And we're like, what idiots? What are they doing? However, we need to understand the spiritual nature of a high place. A spiritual high place is not just a location geographically. A high place is that which obstructs from the one and only place of help and salvation. A counterfeit solution. That which attempts to block the view. That which attempts to distract another door. The way that seems right unto man. So there is a way that seems right unto man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Now, let me give you a simple illustration since we just went through election season. For those of you that are politically inclined, in other words, you have something going on up here when it comes to what just took place uh, this November. Then what we have a tendency to do is, however the enemy does it, I'm not exactly sure, because I, I, I would be very agreeable to the concept if someone brought it up and said, well, we we're in a far better situation politically, governmentally, after this election than we were before it. But I'm right there with you. However, beware of putting your confidence in having the right man in office as being the solution to your life as a Christian. Some of the healthiest Christians that have ever lived lived when Nero was on the throne. And so as a result, it can easily become a replacement for 
the right heart condition before God. Your dependency is upon Jehovah, upon your true king, not upon the right man on the throne because that man in the throne of the presidency of the United States of America will disappoint you. I'm not saying that practically speaking, it isn't a better situation for an evangelical Christian. I'm saying that our soul condition needs to find its rest in Jehovah and not in a counterfeit. That isn't a distraction from the fact that that's a good thing that could have happened for us. However, what it does is it creates an avenue for us to express our relationship to Jesus Christ more clearly. The command to Israel, take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But you shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other god. For the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous god. All right, so uh, if we're going to head into this land flowing with milk and honey, there's 31 hostile empires, and they all worship other gods. So we're entering a territory that we're supposed to take for the name of Jehovah. And when we do, we need to recognize that we can't allow those false gods to remain. So therefore, when we enter, enter into this territory, every part of the land is going to have a dependency upon something other than Jehovah. And so when we come in, what we need to do is tear down these images, these false counterfeit points of reliance. Now, the territory of God that he has purchased with his blood isn't a territory known as Canaan. It is this body. It is this body. God has come in, and he, in Joshua, Yeshua, the same name as Jesus, says, March! And he wants to take claim of a territory. And he wants that territory to come under his control and under his feet. But as he enters into this territory, there is something that this jealous God cares about. And that is that every aspect of this territory is devoted. And if as you're journeying through this life with Joshua, that he says, uh, whoa, we got a, 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 a grove here. We have a, an altar built to Baal over here. What do you do? You already know what to do. Tear it down. Tear it down. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, <clears throat> is a jealous God. He wants this territory all for himself. Deuteronomy 7, but thus shall you deal with them. You shall destroy their altars and break down their images and cut down their groves and burn their graven images with fire. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you nor choose you because you were more in number than any people, for you were the fewest of all people, but because the Lord loved you. And because he would keep the oath with which he swore unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of the bondman from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God which keeps covenant and mercy with them that love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations and repays them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hates him. He will repay him to his face. Thou shalt therefore keep the commandments and the statutes and the judgments which I command thee this day to do them. So what's, what's the commandment? When you enter this land, tear down anything that would exalt itself above Jehovah. Hey, it's not that confusing when you read it in the Old Testament. The translation into our lives in the New Testament becomes a little foggy. I mean, God doesn't actually expect me to give that up, does he? I mean, come on. Why would anyone ever build a high place? That's a good question. Because we believe the lie that salvation is found in more than one place. It's a funny thing, because doctrinally, theologically speaking, if I were to say, is there any other means by which a man can be saved outside of Jesus Christ? I have a hunch that we would have near 100% consensus in this room. I mean, it's pretty daring to come into this room in the first place, right? Uh, and, you know, hey, we're believers. We're conservative believers. Yeah, it's Jesus, okay? Jesus is the lone means of salvation. However, there's a subtle lie that creeps in. Well, Jesus will save you from hell. Yeah, yeah. And he's the only way out of, out of that. 
But when it comes to other areas of your life, I mean, like your finances, I mean, you can't just lean on God. I mean, you have to take things into your own hands. There's certain things that you have to do, and if you don't, whoa, you're sunk. Your health, you can't just rely on, you know, Jehovah Rapha to just keep you healthy. I mean, there's certain things you have to do. Now, even as I'm saying that, you're, you're thinking, well, yeah, of course. I mean, if, if I don't wear a nice winter coat when it's cold out, I'm going to get sick. And, you know, that's practical living. That's absolutely right. However, when it comes down to the base root of the truth, your life is held firmly in the life of God. And that is your sustenance and your salvation in all matters. And then he is the one that tells you how to live from there. But when it comes to your health, you come to him and say, God, this is the body that you purchased with your blood. You care for it. And then he'll teach you what to do with it. But that's wisdom. That's an extension of the gospel transformation of your life. But you don't go to the medicine cabinet and say, this is my salvation. You don't go to the doctor and say, please save me, dear doctor. Your salvation is found in Jehovah, in God Almighty, in all circumstances. Financially, you don't go to your stock portfolio to find your sustenance and your satisfaction because God can and will remove that if necessary to bring you to the point where you recognize where your true dependency must lie. Your confidence isn't in anything but God. Remember Mary of Bethany? Mary of Bethany had a little stock portfolio called an alabaster jar of ointment, spikenard. And she had to lay that down, pour it out on Jesus' feet. And that's the transformation that says, what this woman did should be shared every time someone shares the gospel. Because it is the gospel. The gospel asks us to throw down all high places. Do you have any spikenard in your pantry? Bring it out, bring it out, let's throw it down. That is the template for how we enter into the fullness of God. So the lie, Jesus can supply you with help in the eternity category of your life, but not in the practical stuff. So let's go through some of the practical sides, the health side of life. The sense of being whole and strong is under siege. When you are being attacked physically, I understand. It's very easy to turn outward and to look for a high place. To look for something that's something, oh, yeah, we tried this and this really worked for us. Now, I'm not saying that God can't use those things. I'm saying, where is the first turn in your soul? Who is God in your life in this area? The financial side of life, the sense of being stable and secure is missing. Boy, when you're feeling that un uneven territory that you're walking on and it's unstable, you just want to grip something that will bring security to your life. And as a result, you're vulnerable for a high place. The comfort side of life, the sense of satisfaction, refreshment, and accomplishment is lacking. And as a result, you have a tendency to try and find comfort outside of God. The intelligence side of life, the sense of being right and competent is absent. You've been made fun of long enough. You don't want to be the idiot. And as a result, you're vulnerable to a high place. And you will find yourself easily turning to a counterfeit. Christians do it all the time. We turn to a counterfeit intelligence, doctrinal accuracy, and we oftentimes miss the substance of Jehovah God. The purpose side of life, the sense of being really alive, is simply not present. Uh, midlife crisis uh, for, for many men leads to all sorts of catastrophe. They need a sense of significance, and as a result, they're vulnerable to a high place to find that significance in something other than God. The relational side of life, the sense of being on good terms with and sharing intimacy with others is gone. And as a result, you're extremely vulnerable in the category of relationships. And number seven, the religious side of life, the sense of being good and on good terms with greater powers is missing. I just, I just want to know that God's happy with me. And so what do we do? We go to good works. We do something that we think God would pat us on the back for. We turn to something that God has said, no, no, <laughs> that, isn't, that isn't what makes me happy. We turn to something other than Jesus Christ. The bait of self-preservation. It's a funny thing, but we have a tremendous capacity for self-preserving. To, to actually cause ourselves to have longevity here on this earth. Job security is what it's typically known as in the business world. The woo of self, the woo towards the counterfeit high place. Let's explain what happened in history. 
So we have Solomon, who, for all practical purposes, starts out really strong as a, as a, as a king, and then sort of ends weak. It's sort of a disappointing story, but as a result, the kingdom is split in his when he dies. And so you have Jeroboam and Rehoboam, and the kingdom splits, and you have a northern kingdom, and you have a southern kingdom. The southern kingdom would be known as Judah, and that's what we would understand. It's the, it's the kingdom of Ju Judah and Benjamin, and it was known as the Jews. The northern kingdom, which had a different capital, it had a capital called Samaria, were the ten northern tribes. And so the southern tribes had the, the Jews, had the capital city of Jerusalem. Jesus was king of the Jews. He came through Judah. And so then you have the Samaritans to the north. So the Samaria being their capital. That'll give you a little context here. The split in kingdoms. And so you have Israel to the north and Judah to the south. And it can be confusing for any of you because Israel is also a term for all of the, of the, nation, of the tribes of, of Israel. And so it can be a little awkward. David was the king over all those tribes. It was known as Israel. But then when it splits, you still have the name Israel, but it's just 10 tribes. And then you have the Jews or the Ju uh, kingdom of Judah to the south. And Jeroboam said in his heart, now shall the kingdom return to the house of David. If this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of, Lord, at the, house of the Lord at Jerusalem, then shall the heart of this people turn again unto their Lord, even unto Rehoboam, king of Judah. So Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, is still over those southern kingdoms. Jeroboam feels threatened by this. You see, where are the people commanded to worship according to the scriptures? In the one place, which is understood as Jerusalem, and the house of the Lord, which is known as the temple. They need to bring their offerings, their sacrifices there. However, Jeroboam isn't feeling comfortable with that. Do you know why? That's not in his territory. That's not his capital. So if he's going to be a good king, he needs to do something about this. It says, And Jeroboam said in his heart, Now shall the kingdom return to the house of David, if this people go up to do sacrifice in the house of the Lord of Jerusalem. But they are commanded to. They are commanded to. So we have an issue here. This is the same issue that many of us face. For the bait of self-preservation kicks in. Jeroboam, for self-preserving purposes does something here. And it's, he's even, at the bottom of this, he says, even under Rehoboam, king of Judah, and they shall kill me and go again to Rehoboam, king of Judah. Well, he doesn't want that. Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, it is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. Uh, whoa. We got a big mistake taking place right in front of our eyes right here. Two golden calves? Are those who saved Israel out of the hand of Pharaoh and brought them out of Egypt? Uh, no, I think Israel got in big trouble for doing that in the past. And here they are going back to the same high place. Jeroboam's bait of self-preservation, the same bait we have. Lest we lose our position in our life. Lest we lose the comforts and the delights that we have, we build a high place and call it Christianity. What he does is he calls this the worship of Jehovah. So behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. And he set the one in Bethel, and the other he put in Dan. And this thing became a sin. Mm -hmm. For the people went to worship before the one, even unto Dan. And he made a house of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. Oh, big mistake. Oh, can you believe this? The high place of self. You see, any time we exalt ourselves above God, it is the essence of sin. In fact, that's what sin is. The, the word hamartia that describes what sin is, is to miss the mark. It's an archery term which means I pull back my bow and with my life I shoot out something, an outcome, and it misses. That's not what God intended me to do. So the result is sins, but the cause is sin, which is this. It's self-exalting itself, sitting on the throne that belongs to God and saying, hey, this is my territory, this is my body, this is my life, this is my time, these are my resources. 
I will do with them as I see fit. The gospel calls a man to take his spikenard, his stuff, his energy, his time, his resource, and pour it out on Jesus. The apostasy. So in the midst of that word, apostasy, you see A means the absence of something in the Greek, and pistis is the word for faith. So this is the forsaking of faith. This is giving up faith in Jehovah and putting it in something else. That would be an apostasy, turning from God and giving your faith to a high place, to another God. That would be understood as apostasy. So it's the acceptance of the high place, integrated into the worship of Jehovah, even calling it the worship of Jehovah. Uh Uh-oh. Is it possible that this is what we're doing in Christianity today? That we have built a high place of self, we have removed the clear commands of scripture. He says, hey, there's only one place to bring your sacrifice. And instead, we've built golden calves and say, now, this will be our God and we'll worship this. Is it possible that we have replaced Jehovah, Jesus Christ, with something else? Second Kings, and the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God. And they built them high places in all their cities, from the tower of the watchman to the fenced city. And they set them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burnt incense in all the high places, as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away before them, and wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger, for they served idols. Wherefore the Lord had said unto them, You shall not do this thing. Yet the Lord testified against Israel and against Judah by all the prophets and by all the seers, saying, Turn ye from your evil ways, and keep my commandments and my statutes, according to all the law which I commanded your fathers." And which I sent to you by my servants, the prophets, notwithstanding they would not hear, but hardened their necks like to the neck of their fathers that did not believe in the Lord their God. And they rejected his statutes and his covenant that he made with their fathers and his testimonies which he testified against them. And they followed vanity and became vain and went after the heathen that were round about them concerning whom the Lord had charged them that they should not do like them. And they left all the commandments of the Lord their God and made them molten images, even two calves, and made a grove and worshipped all the host of heaven and served Baal. And they caused their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire and use divination and enchantments and sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. There was none left but the tribe of Judah only. Oh, wow. Wow. See, I'm not just giving you history here. The main reason I'm giving this is for us to have a fresh assessment of how this territory known as our individual life and how this territory known as the Church of Jesus Christ is being kept. Are we allowing anything that would replace Jesus in our midst? From us being fully focused on Jesus Christ, fully dependent upon Jesus Christ, fully loving Jesus Christ. Is there any hindrance in our midst? The five flavors of American apostasy. So I'm going to go through five different things that are taking place in our country and as a result, possibly sneaking into our lives. Because this is the culture we have grown up in. And as a result, we can call these things blind spots. These are not things that are obvious to all of us at first blush any more than it would be obvious to us that we need to give up our spikenard. Which is why what this woman did unto Jesus needs to be mentioned. Because it is actually part of how the gospel interchanges with our life. That if you desire to be filled with life, you need to forsake that which is blocking the way. I use the illustration of a cup of dirty water. And Jesus says, I have living water for you. If you drink of it, you will never die. And we're like, oh, I'd like some of that living water. He says, well, you see, your cup, you, are full of polluted water. So here's what I need you to do. I need you to dump that out. We're like, what? What do you mean dump it out? Can't you give me the living water in, in my polluted water cup? It's not how it works. You need to create room for it. Dump it out. It's called repentance. Repent and receive. Repent and believe. Repent and trust that what he has for you is so much better than what you're leaning on. Forsake the high place. So the five flavors of American apostasy. 
They left the commandments of the Lord. This is the words from, from Scripture. Then I'm going to give uh, the modern version of it. They left the commandments of the Lord their God and made God replicas, counterfeit gods, gods of their own making in the image that they preferred. They built divas, sex symbols, leading men and action heroes whose chiseled bodies, sleek forms, smoldering looks, and dazzling personas became the bait for a nation. They placed them on silver screens and sat and watched their every move, worshiping them as gods. They gave them microphones and gushed with awe as they sang, gave them their money and marveled at their indulgences, and gave them their praises and sincerest adorations. They followed these gods, small g, dressing as they dress, talking as they talk, flexing as they flex, seducing as they seduce, kissing as they kiss, sinning as they sin. Number two, they made a grove, worshiped the sun, moon, and stars instead of the creator and served Baal instead of Jehovah. They made a football stadium, worshiped these superstars, idolized them, mimicked their every move, applauded their every action, cheered when they succeeded, and wept when they lost. They gave their minds and energies to the following of this game and gave every spare thought to considering what might take place in the football stadium next. They served football instead of Jesus. Now, I happen to enjoy movies, and I happen to really like football. So the guy that's talking right now is not necessarily immune to understanding the seriousness of these traps. These are very, very magnetic. I, you know, there's certain people that have never been attracted to football, Leslie being one of them. She cannot figure out why anyone would enjoy that. I grew up watching football, and there's something. I mean, there's a feeling when a football game is on. Especially when it's the fall, when it's winter, it's not as exciting. But when it's fall and you have a certain smell in the air, oh, I love that. It's like Sunday afternoon, it's a game. I mean, I grew up with that. And it can so easily consume my thoughts. Even during the week, I want to hear sports talk. I want to hear what other people are thinking about what's going to happen the next week. I mean, what do you think about our team? How do you think uh, they're looking this year? What do you think their chances are? How, what do you think about that defense? What do you think about number 58? In other words, we have our thoughts that are going through our head, and yet it's not even our reality. It is a false, it's a replacement for something. Instead of finding whatever that is in Jesus, we're finding it in something that actually is not even real to us. Number three, they caused their sons and daughters to pass through the fire, and they caused their sons and daughters to be aborted to be sacrificed for their comfort and their peace of mind, for their God was their own self-interest. They allowed for the devaluing of human life to reign in their day and age, for the value and esteem of self was held preeminent. Number four, they used divination and enchantments, and they built a golden calf church, a church the way, the way that they, the modern populace, would prefer it, and redefined God to be according to their liking, a God who overlooks sin and promotes the esteem of self, they built this church to encourage the construction of high places and to applaud doubt, addiction, and self-pleasure. It was a church that was specifically designed to diminish the word of God and ridicule God's opinion while simultaneously placing all confidence in the, in, in the intellects, opinions, and philosophies of men. It was a church that excused the sins of men and forsook the importance of the cross of Christ. A church that explained away hell and removed the judgment seat of Christ from the thinking and awareness of the congregation. Number five. They sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord. And they shopped and shopped and shopped. They bought and they bought and they bought, believing that by having things they might be happy. But in their buying, they became a slave unto the very things they bought. And in their buying, they ran up debt and became slaves to their creditors. They attempted to find solace and peace in something other than the Lord, and in so doing, performed evil in the Lord's sight. So... Now, that might hit a little closer to home than we would prefer. And I don't even want to make it sound like that's it. The extension of this idea into our lives needs to be applied by the Holy Spirit, not by Eric Ludi. In other words, for me to make a judgment on any behavior, any one behavior, can be very dangerous. There are certain things that affect me and that become bondage for me that don't affect you. For instance, football. Football doesn't affect Leslie at all. And so it wouldn't necessarily be in the short list of things to apply to her. Leslie, you need to be watchful of football. And she'd be like, okay, boy, is that it? Hey, I feel great. That's not an issue for her. For instance, alcohol has no draw to me at all. I mean, at all. I mean, it's the strangest thing, but you know what? I don't want the stuff. I'm not interested in the stuff. Some of you, you get that smell, and it's like the smell of fall and football for me. 
And it's an attraction. It can draw you to something where the enemy baits you and says, you can find solace here. And as a result, some things seem more extreme than others, but anything that would distract us, anything that would take our gaze off of the center, off of Jesus Christ, needs to have a tag on it. Say, whoa, watch that. Watch that. Football itself is not immoral. Movies are not immoral. Are they taking you from the only place is the question. Are they fulfilling something in your life that Jesus is like, hey, that's my business. That's what I intend to do. That's what I want to do in your life. You're like, well, God, your form of comfort isn't quite what I'm looking for. This is comforting. You see, God has supplied everything we need for life and godliness. The question is, are we willing to go to the door to find it? The four kings that didn't complete the task. You know that it's interesting. The Bible breaks it down. I'm going to give you eight kings very quickly. Eight kings. And four of these kings were actually decent kings. But in each of their records, it's mentioned that they didn't quite do what they were supposed to do. What I do not want us to be is in the list of the first four kings here. Because we have every propensity to be here. We want, we're, we're want, we want Jesus. We want to live for Jesus. We want our life to count. However, there is something that separates the mediocre kings from the great kings. And it's one singular thing that this whole message is about. They didn't throw down the high places. So Joash. And Joash did that which was right in the sight of the Lord all his days. Whoa, that's a pretty big statement. Wherein Jehoiada, the priest, instructed him. But, you see that, I made it big. I don't think the scriptures scream the but, but I'm screaming it for you just so you don't miss it. But the high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places. I do not want any of us to live the life of Joash. In every regard, it was right, but he didn't do what was most right. Amaziah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, yet not like David his father. He did according to all things that Joash his father did. How be it? That's the same as but, by the way. How be it the high places were not taken away, as yet the people did sacrifice and burnt incense on the high places. Azariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Boy, does this sound familiar? According to all that his father Amaziah had done. Save, it's the same as but and how be it, by the way. Save that the high places were not removed. The people sacrificed and burnt incense still on the high places. Jotham, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. He did according to all that his father Uzziah had done. How be it? The high places were not removed. The people sacrificed and burned incense still in the high places. He built the higher gate of the house of the Lord. These guys did good stuff and fell short to the point where they weren't considered good kings. You see, I desire that we would not just do that which is right in the sight of the Lord, but go thoroughly through the land and allow the high places to be removed because there are four kings outside of David that God commends, which isn't very many out of all the kings. Four kings. Let's read about them. You're going to notice there's a similarity, just like there is in this list. Before we get there, this is a really fascinating thing. The great twisting, the practice of integrating the worship of Jehovah into the high places had been of such long-standing tradition that Hezekiah's destruction of the high places was declared an act of apostasy from Jehovah. You see, when it becomes so densely associated that, oh, we worship Jehovah with high places. No, this is how we were. This is how I express my love to Jesus. Then when someone comes in and puts their finger on it and says, that is blocking the way of Jehovah in this country. To Hezekiah, who came in and said, we're tearing these things down. Those that were in, I mean, they had, generations and generations had, had had those high places and even called it the worship of Jehovah. Hezekiah says, we come in, we tear these down. There was such a volatile reaction that they even considered it an act of apostasy from Jehovah. How bad do things need to get when you start doing what the Bible says and people consider it bad. The Christians do. Uh, you know, you, Jesus came and lived the pure, holy life. And guess what? Those that were the keepers of the law, those that were the teachers of the law, those that were the Pharisees and Sadducees said, crucify him. You see, we don't want that in the church. 
So Asa. And Asa did that which was good and right in the eyes of the Lord his God. For he took away the altars of the strange gods and the high places and broke down the images and cut down the groves and commanded Judah to seek the Lord God of their fathers and to do the law and the commandment. And he took away out of all the cities of Judah the high places and the images and the kingdom was quiet before him. Jehoshaphat, and his heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord. Moreover, he took away the high places and the groves out of Judah. Hezekiah, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord according to all that David his father did. He removed the high places and broke the images and cut down the groves and broke in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For under those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehushtan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. Nehushtan means that cursed thing. In other words, we're getting rid of that. We're, that's replacing God. Instead of worshiping God, you're worshiping a, a bronze servant which was supposed to lead you to God. Josiah, and he brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense from Geba to Beersheba and broke down the high places of the gates that were in the entering of the gate of Joshua, the governor of the city, which were on the man's left hand of the gate of the city. So what did these four do? They all did the same thing. They threw down high places. This is what marks one who does that which is right in the eyes of the Lord and thoroughly matches with David, their father. See, David is a picture of Jesus. So the kingdom of Jesus is the one that we want to match with. The one that comes in and removes the high places. This is what God's after. The king that performed righteousness. Can you think of a better king that came in and removed high places uh, than Jesus Christ? He has disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. What did he come and do? He threw down the high place. He crushed the head of the serpent, that which exalted itself above God. The cross. So, you want to know the only place? Let's get familiar with it. This is the high place. The main attraction. The place where all of their high places were crushed. The tabernacle on two feet torn down and rebuilt. The door of entry. The way of the, unto the Father. The only place of salvation. God is going to show us a place out of our tribes. Out of our tribes, he's going to show us a place. And this is the place you come to. This is the place you make your offering. This is the place you make your sacrifice. This is the place you come and worship. That place is unto Jesus at that cross. Christ, the doorway to life. All of Christianity is summed up in forsaking your other high places, leaving them all, and coming under the cross and bending your knee and offering your life as your sacrifice. This is how Christianity functions. If there is a spike nard that is hindering your way, you bring it with you and dump it out at that cross. You say, this is what I believe in. What you have done here is my salvation. This is where I place my trust. This is where I put my confidence because my God didn't just die. He rose and he sits triumphant at the right hand of the Father. This is my confidence. Coming to the door. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit. Isn't that sort of shocking? Don't you think of the sacrifices as God, to, of the sacrifices of God being a lamb, a goat, you know, a ram, a heifer? Technically, this is a foreshadow of how we bring our sacrifices. We, we don't bring lambs. That sacrifice is once and for all, yet we still bring a sacrifice. But our sacrifice is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, thou wilt not despise. Hebrews 13, listen to this, this is so powerful. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore let us go forth to him, outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For here we have no continuing city, but we seek the one to come. Therefore by him let us continually offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. But do not forget to do good and to share, for with such sacrifices God is well pleased. It's not Jerusalem, it's not the temple in Jerusalem that we still come to. Let us go outside that city. That was a temporal city. And let's go unto him. Let's go unto Jesus. 
He is the only place now. That which used to be the shadow placeholder of the one place has now been torn down, but Jesus is resurrected. And he is the place we go. He is the one we come to. Coming unto Jesus, the most high. No, see, remember what I was going to call this? I was going to call it the most high. That's because that's, that's what it means. He's the most high. I mean, there's high places all over the place. It's sort of like there's kings, but he's the king of kings. He's the high place of all high places. He trounces under his feet all other authorities. He is God most high. For the Lord Most High is awesome. He is the great king over all the earth. Offer to God thanksgiving and pay your vows to the Most High. I will cry out to God Most High, to God who performs all things for me. So when you come unto Jesus Christ, what's your position? When you are in Christ, you have access unto the fullness of God. Everything that is required, everything that is needed for life and godliness, you have access to it. To satisfy, to strengthen, to empower this life, this body, to function on this earth the way God intends it to function. And so as a result, there is nothing outside of Christ that is missing. It's not like, oh, well, yeah, I mean, God, you took care of this, but I mean, what about entertainment? I mean, there's a whole part of me, God, that needs to have something going. You know, like some good music. I mean, church music is eh. But, you know, something that gives me a little beat. Something that satisfies this craving that I have. I mean, come on, God, you're rather boring. And so I need something like this in addition to you. This is the bait of the enemy. The enemy will con you and appeal to your flesh and say, come on. God can't meet that. The only way to deal with that is outside. You can't go to that place. You need to, I mean, okay, go to Jesus on Sundays. But now, the rest of the week, let's, let's get to some living. That's the only way you can really function as a Christian. Come on. But when you are in Jesus, we are made whole and strong. The health yearning is solved. You know that it, it's an interesting phenomenon. But even if, I mean, we live in bodies that are wasting away. Let's just get down to brass tacks here. You know, there's this body is... I mean, I'm already having issues. People know that, the students know that I have an issue when I do a, a forward roll. My vestibular gland is all messed up and I like pass out. It's like, come on, Ludie, when you were 18, you could do a forward roll without any issue. Now it's like I go off to the side. Come on. See, my body is getting weaker as it gets older. I don't like saying that to any of you because, you know, you still want to think as a 45, I'm almost 46-year-old guy. It's like, yeah, I'm st I still got it. However... In reality, my body can't do what it used to do. And yet, that doesn't make me feel insecure. Because in Christ, you see this health yearning, this desire for immortality, whatever it is that craves, you know, some pool of youth, fountain of youth out there, is solved. I don't, I don't mind aging. I'm fine. And guess what? I have full confidence that whatever I'm called to in this earth, I'll have the strength for it. I'm not afraid of you know, this sickness or this sickness. I have Jesus. Jesus sustains me. So in big picture understanding, I no longer need to go to a high place here. I'm at rest in the fact that this body belongs to Jesus and he can carry it all the way to the finish line. I really don't care if I die at 46 or if I die at 93. I know where I'm going. And my body's gonna be a lot better version when I get there. So hey, bring it on. To live is Christ, to die is gain. Suddenly the health side of my life has context. And no longer do I have that itch to say, but well, I need to solve this. I can't ever feel this. It's like, no, I have Jesus, and he's going to carry me through this. In Christ, we are made stable and secure. The financial yearning is solved. My strength is in the Lord and in the strength of his might. You see, I find life and power and sustenance, not in my bank account, but in the fact that my father has everything I need. He does. And so even if you could look at my bank account and shake your head and go, you stink. I could say, well, have you ever seen his bank account? Because that's what I draw on. I draw on a bank account that no one in this room can see. And I have access to it as a child of the king of heaven. And though in this natural realm I look weak, and practically, yeah, I, am, I don't know how I'm going to pay that bill next week. But he does. 
And so I turned to him, and as a little child, I say, Father, I submit my life practically to you. I will work hard. I will do everything you ask me to do, but I trust the outcome to you. You always meet my needs. Number three, we are satisfied and refreshed. The comfort yearning is solved. I, I did a test on this a few years back because I had experienced euphoria in this natural realm when the Broncos won the Super Bowl. The first Super Bowl they ever won it was one of the greatest moments emotionally I had ever had. <laughs> now, if you're not a Broncos fan, you may not understand what that meant, okay? After four abysmal losses, then to suddenly win. And we were underdogs. And to win! And I was, I, were, I, went, I never honked a horn on a, on a car in my life. I was driving down the interstate honking. Eh, eh, ah! I mean, what was that? Eric Ludy felt something. And so I came to God on that. It says, you know, at his right hand are pleasures forevermore. And I, I, I'm seated in heavenly places in Christ. Where is he seated? At his right hand. Therefore, I'm in the place where there are pleasures forevermore. Okay, God, I read it in scripture. I don't know it practically. I don't understand that practically. Okay, I can believe it in my mind, but I need to know that. And so, I went on a whole season of searching that out. I turned away from all those other pleasure sources that I was finding that life in. I said, God, I'm going to fast that so I can know you. Aren't you guys fascinated? All I can say is this. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. I found something where I don't have to have that. I don't have to. I have more than is sufficient. It's like the Super Bowl of the soul where my team wins every time. If you, if you follow football, you'll notice one thing is a constant. Your team doesn't always win, which leads to this sort of a life. <laughs> it's hard. It really is. When John Elway retired, I cried. I did. I don't like admitting that, but I did. It was a very hard moment for me. We are given truth and are entrusted the mind of Christ. The intellectual yearning is solved. For those of you that feel you have to know things, what better to know than Jesus Christ? What does Paul say? To know him. To know him. That's what he went after. Instead of just knowing data and knowledge and facts, know him. And it solves that dimension of your existence. We are made alive. The purpose yearning is solved. Uh, we, I don't know, I've never been in any other body but mine. But I know there is a craving for a sense of purpose. It's really hard to wake up in the morning when you don't know what you're getting up for. In fact, you just want to go back to sleep. We long to know why we're here. We long to know what this life is about. Why am I here, God? Why did you put me here? In Christ, that's solved. Can I show my life through you? Can I use you as my chosen vessel in this world so I, I can speak through your mouth and I can lead people to me? You want to use this? I do. I've chosen you. Well, you know what? You can't get any higher than that. So we talk about a high occupation. That's the highest occupation. Chosen of God to reveal his glory in this realm. Now, that's something to wake up for. However, some of you are like, I already know that. I want no, you must not know it. Because if you know that, it'll change your life. We are given love for our brother and entrusted the ministry of reconciliation. The relationship yearning is solved. We are justified and reconciled unto God. The religious yearning is solved. You see, actually everything that we can find a counterfeit for is solved in Jesus. Long and short, he solves it. Whether you believe that or not, you have to exercise this one truth and you will find it. And even if you have to take a season like I did, like God, okay, I know Eric said something about finding, uh, you know, this great pleasure in just knowing you as opposed to football. I don't know that God, but I want to. You see, he is a safe depository for your affections, your time, your attentions, your life. Some of us feel like we're risking everything to give up this pleasure over here and give ourselves to Jesus because the enemy's going to say, oh boy, you're going to be bored. Oh, that's blasé. Oh, you're going to lose this. This was like the only reason worth living. Have you ever had it where you, you haven't eaten 
for a little bit. You're doing that whole fast thing. I love food. I didn't know I loved food because I don't even think about food during the day. I'm like one of those guys that will just lose weight uh, on accident. Uh, and all these other people, how do you do that? I'm not trying to do it, believe me, because I forget a meal. I just don't think about food until I'm fasting. And when I'm fasting, some of you have heard the story. I remember this one time I had a week-long fast. I was young. Okay, it was a long time ago. And about day three, I whipped out the cookbooks. And during my time, instead of praying, I was studying cookbooks. <laughs> See, when, when you remove certain things from your life, in the very first phase, you'll notice that there's a depression that will come in. It, life turns gray. And most people don't make it through that season. You know that if you're addicted to anxiety and stress, one of the first things that happens when you get off of anxiety and stress is you go into depression. There's nothing to lift you up because you've been lifted up by anxiety and stress. And now suddenly you don't have that to cheer you. What you're supposed to do when you first feel that weight downward is turn to Jesus. And then he will buoy you. However, most of us are trying to just go cold turkey without Jesus. In other words, if you're going to give something up, make sure you have something better to replace it with. You do have something better. You don't need to feel bad for yourself. Self-pity doesn't come into this whole kingdom equation. You have something better. No one should feel sorry for you. I've got the fullness of Jesus. For thus says the high and lofty one that inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. This is what he says. I dwell in the high and holy place. He dwells in the highest place, guys. With him also that is of a contrite and humble spirit. So who's going to be there with him? Those that do not think highly of themselves, but think highly of him. To revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. For all that is in the heaven and the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord, and thou art exalted as head above all. For thou, Lord, art high above all the earth. Thou art exalted far above all gods. The high place, the only place, Jesus Christ. Everything else is a counterfeit high place. That's not really high. That's low. You see, the enemy wants to say, I can lift you up higher. I can give you pleasures that God can't. God is high above all other high places. He trounces them. He makes them look ridiculous. You come to God and he satisfies. He knows why he created you. He knows what you're created for. But you must trust him. So what should we do? Simply put, we must throw down the high places. So in your life, you're going to notice that these four kings that actually are acclaimed of God in Scripture did something and they did it aggressively even though there were a lot of people in the land that were groaning, mumbling, and complaining the whole while they were coming up to those altars and tearing them down. I want you to get a little attitude inside of your soul. And I want you to go through your life and start tearing things down in the authority of Jesus' name. Listen to this in 2 Corinthians. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for what are our weapons mighty for? We have been given strength and authority in Christ Jesus for something. Listen to this. For pulling down strongholds. Palais. Whew. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. How do we do this throwing down thing? We must purpose in Christ to act, to growl, to do, to engage the enemy of our souls. You cannot be bullied by these things in your life. It's hard. I mean, whenever someone touches something sacred in my life, to call it sacred is a dangerous way of describing it. But it's those untouchable arenas. It's sort of like, okay, you can preach to me about everything, but don't touch this. If you find yourself extra guarded, like you have a little extra uh, bubble wrap around certain areas of your soul, you might want to poke at that. You might want to allow the Spirit of God a little closer in there, because what, what are you hiding there? 
you know, whether it's your coffee intake during the day, some of you are feeling like close to the edge on certain things. Like, wait, he didn't bring up that, did he? I, I, I just mentioned it. I didn't say that it was a problem. I just mentioned it. Of course, some of you can say, what about your chai, Eric? What? And we're talking about you right now, guys. <laughs> Whatever it is in our life, are we willing to expose it to God and say, God, is this replacing you? Is this standing in the way of my worship of you? Is this causing me to find comfort, life, stimulation outside of you when in fact I'm supposed to find that in you? You see, I don't want you to live under condemnation. I genuinely want you to be free and liberated as a Christian and full of life and love. But to do that, you need to still allow the Holy Spirit freedom to move in your soul. I don't fear a movie. I don't. But I always want to hold my soul before God and say, God, am I turning to that for the wrong reasons? Is that edifying my relationship with you? Is it drawing me closer to you? If not, then you know what? I'm going to go without it. That's the same with anything. We all have different magnetic poles. And so, like for instance, I'm not a hunter either. And so I could make some great speech about, and is your hunting replacing this? However, you'd want to turn back to me and say, hey, Eric, what about the Broncos? What about politics? What about uh, my old time radio shows? Eric? Hey, uh, you see, I want to remove the bubble wrap and say, God, this is afresh. I've done this many times before, but right now, I'm just doing it afresh. I want this body, this life, my time on earth to be dedicated to you. So no condemnation, just conviction. Sweet old conviction. The classic four threats to the soul of Eric Ludi. See, I'm getting it out on the table. I'm not too happy about this, but... I stuck it on the end. Money, but not in the classic sense. See, I, I live without money all the time. This, this ministry's impossible to run. I need supernatural provision like almost every single month. So what does that cause me to do? Every single month, I have a pull to a high place. I have a pull to a solution outside of what God has wanted me to do. Every single month. And I know, I mean, there's one, there's, sometimes I'm just saying, God, haven't I learned this yet? Okay, can't you just fill a barn with a whole bunch of cash from now on? I won't have to learn this lesson. Instead, what this lesson does is it drives me to him every month. See, I could look at it in a positive or a negative way. Yes, there is a bait and a vulnerability to do something outside of what he's commissioned me to do. And yet, every month, I'm brought afresh to my knees to say, God, this is yours. You must do it. You are my provider. You knew this situation before I even came to it. You saw it ahead and you've put a ram in the thicket. And every time, he does. Every time, living testimony of it, every time, that doesn't make it easy. And there's part of me that wants to have a stash of cash over here. If I could just have this. And so there's all sorts of baits for that. Whether it's you know, invest in this or you know, get involved in this. And if I could just get something whipped up over here, then... I could put my trust in that instead of God. Oh, boy, I like that idea. It happens. In other words, it's a vulnerability. There's nothing wrong with business. There's nothing wrong with provision. The core question is, am I willing to rest? Even if I have the money, am I willing to give it up? Could you imagine? God, I build this business, and God's saying, yeah, how's that going over there? I'm like, oh, finally, you know, I got something going. I don't. And then he says, are you willing to give that up? What? See, now I'm beginning to put my weight on something that isn't him. So the point is, it isn't the money. I need money. God knows that. However, it's where my confidence rests. It's where my worship and my satisfaction are found. Politics. I thought I was immune to all this political stuff. I mean, I, I used to teach constitutional law. I used to be very engaged in this mentally. And then all this entire election season, I've been fine. Okay, I'll drop a little nuggets, you know, a little jab in every now and then in my sermons. But overall, you haven't heard me talk about it. I'm not just jabbering about the election. I'm fine. And I tell you what, just like that, do you remember the hanging chad? You had to be sort of old uh, in here to, to remember that. I didn't realize how old I was until I was talking to some people and they had no clue what that was. Uh, but the Al Gore, uh, George W. Bush election, I tell you what, I must have spent a week straight watching Fox News. 
I'm dead serious. And it's like, okay, God, I need to be set free from this. And so I thought I'd work through this, okay, where I'm not going to get engaged like that again. And the next thing you know, when this election happened, I wasn't even watching the news that night. Wasn't even watching. Leslie swiped her phone and found out that Ohio and Florida had gone to Trump. And I was like, no way. And then I, that part of me, that part of me that just, <laughs> I have to know. I mean, I can't, I mean, this is my country and I need to know how to pray. I need to, I need to know. <laughs> I would say for the next four or five days, I, I mean, almost always it was on my brain. And I, I was hungry for information. All these riot, riots are going on. I need to know, I need to know. I recognize that every turn, this is why I'm giving you this message, because this is like fresh for me. I had to freshly let it go and say the world will go on without my opinion on it. I have a job to do, and it's very specific. I need to focus on Jesus Christ. I am able to serve a body, serve my marriage, and serve my family when I'm focused on Jesus. I am of no use when I make something other than Jesus my focus. It does not mean that I need to be brainless on either of these top two things. Sports. I sometimes wish the Broncos would just have a bad team because it's easier for me. It is. If the Colorado Rockies are mediocre, if the Nuggets just stay below 500, I'm happy. I'm happy spiritually because when they start to do good, it intrigues me. And there's a part of me that longs for that information. I, I, it's hard on a Sunday afternoon when I'm hanging out with the family and we're enjoying ourselves and I know it's a big game. And it's like, God, I just, if you could just accidentally tell me what the score is, just have it float through. Have someone walk down there and go, oh, the Broncos won. And I'm like, oh, really? Okay, now I can focus. <laughs> but as a result, there's a pull that I have to deliberately throw down. It doesn't mean the Broncos are evil. It just means for me, it's a vulnerability to take me off task. Entertainment. So I labor to come up with creative means of enjoying family time. So I, I went through this whole project of finding old time radio shows. And I have all these old time radio shows now that are just great. I mean, they're really fun, they're very uh, hilarious. Some of them are serious, you know, Lone Ranger. Uh, and so I have all these uh, radio shows and I realized that instead of us praying as a family, I wanted to do another radio show. And so even a radio show, my form of entertainment, which is all old fashioned, I mean, if it's old fashioned, it has to be fine. Doesn't it? I mean, if it takes up all your day as a family, wouldn't that be fine? God's had to freshly put his finger on that and say, it doesn't matter. It's still a replacement, just like it was for them. When the old ranger show was on, I bet there was a pastor who was like, I need to give up the old ranger. Uh, the old ranger? The lone ranger, sorry. <laughs> In other words, it's still a replacement. It doesn't mean it's bad. It doesn't mean it's evil. It's just what place it holds in our life always needs to be low. It cannot take a preeminent position where it pushes out the things that matter most. If I start losing my time with Jesus, if I start losing my time with my wife, if I start losing my time with my children, I start losing my time with the body of Christ, something is wrong. And as a result, there needs to be a watchfulness of our soul. And if you are coming into your understanding of like this body is for you to keep in accordance with the authority of Jesus Christ, what are you gonna do? Pull a Josiah. Come in and look through the land, and if there's anything that would exalt itself above Jesus, tear it down. Identifying what you need to throw down. This is how we're finishing. I've been identifying what I need to throw down. Every single one of those God has walked me through over the past few weeks, and I've just had to say, no, no. I can easily awaken to them. I can easily be stirred towards those things. I recognize that, but I also know what I'm here for on this earth. And I'm not going to fear those things, I'm going to recognize that in every situation that there is a bait to replace Jesus in my life and to find comfort and satisfaction somewhere else. But I'm freshly choosing today to find my comfort and satisfaction in one known as Jesus Christ. And I'm the happiest man on earth because of it.